Quick question. Did you ever think it was possible to solve your own murder? Scratch my head looking at this title for the past five minutes. And I'm like, uh, huh? So you know it's done pulled me all the way in, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm hyped. So today's video, man, is the top three stories. Get this now. The top three stories of people who solved their own murders. Make it make sense to me. And I know y'all can because y'all are a lot smarter than me. That's why I rock with y'all. You know what I mean? They always told you as a kid, if you was the smartest one in the room, you need to change rooms. And that's what I did, man. I got in a big old room with a bunch of smart people, y'all. And um, yeah, I'm looking at y'all for answers for, for this title. So uh, shout outs to the channel Explore With Us. If you haven't subscribed to them, go do so. Dope channel, great content. All right, if you haven't subscribed here, do so. And then join us. Quick little acknowledgement of some haters out there, man. Moment of silence for the haters. That's enough. Now run the likes up. Make sure y'all hit that like button. Let's check this craziness out. Disclaimer. Murder cases are often the hardest to solve. Frequently, it is a small hint or a missed clue that cracks the case, leading to an arrest and conviction. But today, we are taking a look at some truly unusual murder cases that were solved in the most unconventional ways. What is up, Iwu crew? Today, we are taking a look at three cases where the victims solved their own deaths after they had died. It still don't sound In right. many ways, these are the victims who got the truest form of revenge as they are the ones who name their killers and ensure that justice is served. Our first case is one that proves the importance of taking a closer look at clues, as they just might reveal exactly what you are looking for. In 2003, Amarjit Chowan was a successful businessman with the Seba Freight Company in London, England. The 46-year-old lived with his 25-year-old wife, Nancy. Their two young sons, 18-month-old Devinder. 40-something and got him a youngin'. You know what I mean? I ain't knocking nobody how to get down. How you get down is how you get down. Live your life, Stella. That's for the Stellas out there to go get the young cougars. And I, I don't know what the title is for the dudes that, that like younger women. You know what I mean? Sugar dad is that what y'all still call them? Sugar daddies? My bad. Back to the story. Sorry. <laughs> wife Nancy, their two young sons, 18-month-old Devinder and two-month-old Ravinder, and Nancy's mother, Karanjit Kar. Amarjit's work with his fruit and vegetable distribution company had made him rich. In fact, he was reported to be a multi-millionaire. And though he was flourishing, everything was about to go terribly wrong for the family. On February 15th, 2003, Nancy called her brother, Ankar Verma, who lived in New Zealand. She told him that she was worried because she hadn't heard from Amarjit and that he hadn't returned to their home after he was meant to have finished work. Apparently, she couldn't get him on the phone. But when she contacted the freight company where he worked, she was told he had gone on a supposed urgent business trip to the Netherlands. Nancy had told her brother that she was upset because Amarjit hadn't told her about the trip himself. What's more, she doubted that he could travel as his passport was reportedly being held by the UK government, as he had applied for permanent residency. She didn't understand why his employees would have lied to her about her husband's whereabouts. Then things became even more concerning when she received a message from Amarjit which said that he would be back soon. The problem was, he always messaged her in Punjabi, and this one was written in English. Things just weren't adding up. But another twist came when Ankar could no longer get a hold of his sister. Hmm? After worrying for a few days, he decided to contact Scotland Yard on February 19th. When the family's London flat was visited, however, 
Ankar was told that there was no sign of Nancy, nor anyone else. In fact, there were no clues at all about what had happened to the Chowan family or where they could have gone. The house wasn't disturbed, no clothing had been taken, and the children's toys were still on the ground where they had been dropped. As there was no sign of a struggle, investigators considered the chance that the family had simply left their home in a hurry. So are we sure he only dabbles in distribution with whatever it was? Was it fruits or was it uh, food distribution or something like that? Well, are we sure? Wasn't no distribution of no other stuff? Big boy stuff? Why well, else would you disappear without a trace unless... Some, somebody's kidnapped you and then they came and got your family. I'd definitely be looking into what really was he into and who did he make any enemies, man? When you get money, when you start making money, bro, the enemies come out of nowhere. Trust. Further investigation began to suggest that the family may have been kidnapped. It was discovered that Amarjit hadn't been heard from since February 14th, while his family was last seen on February 16th. The investigation was stunted from the beginning, with no sign of where the Chowan family had gone. But on March 24th, a typewritten letter was sent to Amarjit's place of work, which stated that he and his family had moved to Calais, France, where they were living happily but they would soon travel to India. This was impossible, as the UK's government still had the family's passports. Despite this lead, it didn't bring investigators any closer to finding the Chowan family. They appeared to have simply vanished. But then in April, during a family's canoeing trip along the Bournemouth Pier, they discovered something horrible in the water. A body. It belonged to Amarjit. Further investigation found Nancy's body in the same area, though it wasn't uncovered until July, while her mother's body was discovered off the Isle of Wight in a bay. Dang, they killed the mom too. Oh, I hope they didn't kill the child too, bro. Like, that's, that's different there. Him, you'd have been like, okay. It's something he was into, maybe didn't know. Uh, then the wife. That's his spouse. They're going to go after her, too. But dang, even the mom? So somebody's getting at you to the point where they're trying to erase your entire family? That's different level of, of uh, something that you're into. You're into something in my mind now. In November, the two baby boys' bodies were never found. Now that the case was a murder investigation rather than missing persons, Authorities began looking into every possible means to find out who could have killed the Chowan family. At first, there was nothing to help investigators. But then, from beyond the watery grave, Amarjit managed to leave a final clue for detectives to discover. Something had alerted Amarjit before his death. He began to suspect that his life was in danger and that someone might soon try to kill him. He decided that the best way to alert the police to his suspicions was write a letter. Amarjit was killed before he could send it, but that didn't stop him from alerting police to his suspicion about who might be the one to kill him. During the initial examination of Amarjit's body and clothing, nothing appeared amiss. There was evidence that he had been gagged, and a blood toxicology report showed that he had been exposed to high levels of a sedative. Hmm. But this fit the police theory that he had been kidnapped. It wasn't until months later when Amarjit's sock was more closely examined that the letter was discovered. Just before he had died, Amarjit had tucked the letter deep into the folds of his sock. And knowing his eventual fate, he was likely hoping that its contents would help solve his death. Even though the paper had been completely soaked through by seawater, Detective thinking. Chief Inspector David Little said that the ink was still legible because of how Amarjit had tightly folded the paper. Wow, I was sitting here just like, how did that survive the water? I, I'm telling you, man, karma makes a way for you to get caught, bro. 
Karma will do that to you. He had folded the letter with the ink on the inside many times over and over, preserving the important words within. The actual contents of the letter turned out to be unimportant. However, Amarjit had addressed it to Kenneth Regan, and it was dated February 12th, the day before Amarjit went missing. Authorities immediately began looking into Regan, who was allegedly a known drug dealer with a criminal record. Police used cell phone site analysis, and they quickly put together a promising timeline. Amarjit's phone was traced to be near Stonehenge on the 13th, and Reagan, along with the men believed to be his accomplices, Bill Hornsey and Peter Rees, were allegedly also shown to be in the same area. I said, I said it, drugs, didn't I tell y'all? He, he had to be in something else. Not saying he was, but it had to be something else. Maybe they wanted distribution since he had all his distribution, and they used his distribution to get their stuff out. Maybe he said no, they execute him. Or maybe he said yes, got in, and something, maybe he was still, I don't know. It's, it's a thousand ways it could spread from there, but I knew it had to be something else. The site analysis also showed that Regan and Hornsey were near the Chowan family home on the same day they went missing. Police allege that Regan's motive was purely greed. They theorized that his plan had been to kill Amarjit and his entire family so he could gain control of his multi-million dollar freight company and use it to bring drugs into the country. An article by- I'm telling y'all, man, detective, it's, it's next, bro. I'm, I might be a detective soon. Y'all might want to watch out. <laughs> nah. Medium.com reports that Reagan made Amarjit sign blank papers, which he then purportedly later typed on to say that the millionaire had handed the company over to him. Police believe that for several days, Amarjit was tied up and held hostage at his own house before he was finally killed, and he and his family's bodies were eventually dumped in the sea. As police closed in on Reagan, Hornsey, and Rees, the men fled. Rees was found hiding in Gloucestershire, while Reagan and Hornsey managed to get on a ferry to Calais, where they were on the run from authorities for a few months. Regan was eventually arrested in Belgium, and soon after, Hornsey gave himself up at Dover. During the ensuing trial, all three men denied any role in the Chowan family's death, and Regan even alleged that an Asian gang had killed the Chowans and forced him to dispose of their bodies. However, the letter Amarjit wrote, along with other evidence, was used to help convict the men. According to The Guardian, all three were sentenced to life imprisonment, with Reagan and Hornsey being found guilty of the family's murders, and Reese sentenced for Amarjit's murder and convicted of assisting an offender, but cleared of the other four murder charges. The next case we have for you today is something right out of a spy movie. And yet, it's all true. In order to understand the case best, we have to do a bit of history. Many of us have heard of the KGB, which used to be the main security agency for the Soviet Union. The KGB's main reason for existence was to quell any dissent, which was largely seen as anyone harboring anti-communist ideology within the Soviet Union. The KGB is still infamous today for their reportedly violent methods. When the Soviet Union ended, the KGB was replaced with the lesser-known FSK, and then the FSB, which reportedly operated similarly. This is where our case begins. Alexander Litvinenko was born in Vornish, Russia in 1962. His career flourished as soon as it began, graduating from the Kirov Higher Command School and becoming a platoon commander in the Soviet ministry in 1985. The next year, he was reportedly recruited by the KGB as an informant in the counterintelligence section. By 1988, he is said to have transferred to the KGB's third chief directorate before he officially became an operational KGB officer. In this role, Alexander saw active military service and began to focus on the infiltration of organized crime within Russia. 
His name and career became known to the Western world, and the media began referring to him somewhat inaccurately as a Russian spy. In fact, he only dealt in secrets regarding organized crime groups. In 1995, the KGB, which had become the FSK in 91, was replaced with the FSB. But Alexander's career remained largely the same until in 1997, when he was promoted to the FSB Directorate of Analysis and Suppression of Criminal Groups. Everything seemed to be going well for Alexander. But that wouldn't last. In his work, Alexander discovered some things that were better left unknown, at least for his own safety. He purportedly found incriminating links between top brass of Russian law enforcement agencies and Russian mafia groups. Oh. Alexander had earned his prosperous career by ruthlessly seeking out and getting rid of organized crime groups. And so, in 1998, when he discovered corruption within the highest levels of Russian law enforcement, he attempted to bring it to the attention of his superiors. In bad move. Bad, bad move. Bro, the cops have been in pocket. And don't, let's not say have been, are still. I still believe cops are in pocket with certain organizations or gang affiliates or mob, inst whatever you want to call or whoever you want to, they're in pocket. Certain cops are in pocket, bro. And when you go to try to expose that, they're wiping you off the face of the earth, no question. He should have sat down and really had a conversation with himself before doing that. You know what I'm saying? Because you know the right thing is the right thing, and we all want to do the right thing. But it's not us, because sometimes we're we're willing to die for the right thing. It's the others that's behind us that they taking out. Remember the previous story? They took him out. They took his wife out. They took his mom out. They took his kids out. Well, we don't know about the kids. The kids were never found. But... That's how they do. They wipe out your whole family. He, I hope he, decision time on this dude. Russian law enforcement, he attempted to bring it to the attention of his superiors, including a man named Vladimir Putin. Putin would become prime minister in 1999. Alexander brought his proof of corruption in the FSB to Putin. And Alexander later reflected on the meeting saying, I could see in his eyes that he hated me. <laughs> Still, Alexander did not give up, and he held a press conference regarding the corruption. This resulted in his dismissal from the FSB. But more concerningly, Alexander had put a target on his back and made enemies of very powerful men. A huge target. Though he was reportedly ordered not to leave Moscow, Alexander and his family fled to London in October of 2000 seeking political asylum and protection. He was granted asylum in 2001. Though he was reportedly convicted of charges of corruption back in Russia, Alexander began a prominent career as a journalist and author in England, even coining the term Mafia State to describe Russian politics. Alexander once again found himself within the web of spying as he was allegedly recruited by MI6 in England to consult on organized crime in Europe, but mostly Russian-related mafia activity. In 2006, he was even set to give a statement in Spain about Russian mafia influence within Spanish borders. It was his involvement in this perilous line of work that would come back to haunt him. On November 1st, 2006, Alexander suddenly felt very ill. Two days later, he was admitted to a hospital in London, but he was soon moved into intensive care. His illness didn't make sense. At only 40... Do you believe in coincidences? Shouldn't, especially not in these incidences. They was never gonna give up trying to wipe him out. Four, Alexander was a healthy and strong man and his symptoms didn't look anything like the doctors had seen before. He had severe diarrhea and vomiting, but also could barely walk. Poison. After a series of tests, it was determined poison that Alexander was suffering from poisoning. Not just two for two tonight, y'all. I'm telling y'all. Detective L reporting for duty. Just any poisoning. 
He had been given polonium-210, a highly rare and toxic element. Alexander had acute radiation syndrome. Mm. Polonium-210 is one of the deadliest toxins, about 250 billion times more toxic than hydrogen cyanide. One gram of polonium-210 could kill 50 million people and make 50 million more ill. Alexander could have died after consuming less than one millionth of that amount. But how on earth had Alexander come in contact with such a rare poison in the middle of London? Alexander knew he was going to die. There was no way to survive the poison that was coursing through his veins and shutting down his organs as it went. But he wasn't going to die without first catching the people who had poisoned him. The day that he had first become sick, Alexander had met with Dmitry Kovtun and Andrei Lugovoy at the Millennium in London. Alexander and Lugovoy had once worked together in the FSB. The men had met up to chat about old times, just as they had previously in October. While together, Alexander took a few sips of the green tea that they had ordered. Alexander remembered that he was the only one to drink the tea. As he lay dying in the hospital, he told authorities about his suspicions. As police began investigating, they carefully traced the two men's paths. They discovered that Coveton had left traces of polonium in the house he had been staying at in Hamburg before coming to London, as well as in his car. When investigators began looking, they found traces of polonium in the men's hotel room, restaurant tables, and even on a shisha pipe. Radiation was also found in the men's bathroom at the Millennium Hotel. Alexander's poisoning is believed to have exposed 700 people to radiation, mm. but at such a low level that no one else became sick. Alexander had been right about the tea, and investigators discovered a hot teapot in the Millennium Hotel, meaning it was radioactive. Alexander's wife accused Moscow of sending Kovtun and Lugovoy to kill him, though she never named anyone who she thought gave the command, specifically out of fear for her own life. Scotland Yard made a statement saying, The evidence suggests that the only credible explanation is in one way or another, the Russian state is involved in Litvinenko's murder. After suffering for 22 days, on November 22, 2006, Alexander's heart failed. Can you imagine 22 days, bro? 22 days of suffering through this type of poison, through this lethal dose of it that he had. 22 days, man. Dude was strong. He fought it. And he held on just long enough for him to get this job done. And he died. Because of political implications, it is only suspected that he was assassinated. Though Kovtun and Lugovoy denied any role in Alexander's poisoning and death, a witness came forward to say that they had heard Kovtun refer to Alexander as a traitor, whom he intended to make an example of. Mm -hmm. There is an irony to the fact that shortly after Alexander died, Kovtun was hospitalized for radiation poisoning. Lugovoy was named as the primary suspect in Alexander's death, while Kovtun was said to be the second suspect. Russia has refused to extradite either men to be charged or receive a trial. Alexander spent his last few days alive making sure to gather as much evidence as possible against the men he believed to have poisoned him. And perhaps one day they will see justice. Today's third and final case is wow. just as shocking as the previous two, and it shows the importance of trusting one's own instincts. Russ Stagger worked as a football coach at Durham High School. In that position, he was popular and well-liked. In the late 1970s, he had divorced his first wife, Jo Lynn Snow, after five years, and though they were both sad to have the relationship end, they remained friends. However, Russ felt lonely after his divorce and missed that close relationship with someone he trusted. It was a year later that he met the beautiful widowed 31-year-old Barbara Terry. 
Their meeting seemed like the perfect story. Accidentally bumping into each other when she came to see a house he was selling, and they both instantly felt a strong attraction. After a whirlwind romance, Russ proposed to Barbara after only a few months of dating, and the seemingly happy couple married in 1979. Wow. Russ even adopted Barbara's two sons she had during her previous marriage. Russ continued his job and also began teaching driver's ed, while Barbara, who was known to be the perfect homemaker, worked as a secretary at Duke University and as an ad salesperson for a radio station. She was even an aspiring author. The couple reportedly needed both jobs, as they were known by friends and family to spend money almost as fast as they made it, buying new clothes, cars, and even a beach getaway. However, not everything was as it seemed. Hmm. Russ soon discovered that Barbara had been lying to him about their finances, and the couple was deeply in debt. Allegedly, Barbara had even forged his signature on financial paperwork, and there are claims that she had begun a scheme with the banks by borrowing money from one and paying it off with a loan from another. She also had allegedly lied to Russ and the banks about selling a novel for $100,000, when in fact she had been rejected by a publishing house. Regardless, she reportedly used a forged letter made from the rejection letter as collateral in order to keep receiving loans. See, this is why people don't trust each other in marriages and why they have so many issues in marriages as far as having the whole joint account discussion. The joint account discussion, man, continues to be uh, a topic, bro. Because, you know, ideally you would think we come together, we get married, we fall into one account, everything comes in, everything goes out, we both know about it, it's communication back and forth, we agree on things to purchase things we build. Like, we're supposed to be building this thing together. When you keep it separate, it's like, it's kind of saying without saying you don't trust the person. But that's a whole different conversation and topic for another day. You know what I'm saying? When Barbara explained that she had gotten in over her head, Russ eventually forgave her, but insisted that from then on, he would be the one in charge of their finances. He believed that they could pay off the debt. They only had to cut the extravagant buying and move to a smaller house. Russ even asked his parents for help paying for the debt, which they agreed to. Something that is important to know about Russ is that he often slept with a handgun below his pillow, just in case of any emergency during the night was said that Barbara liked knowing that they could use it to protect themselves if they needed to. Which well, I sleep with it under the pillow instead of beside you in a drawer or something like that. What's the difference between reaching up under the pillow and then over to the side? I just always have the fear of you blowing your head off in the middle of the night. I don't know. Which is exactly what ended up happening. Or at least, that was the story. On February 1st, 1988, Barbara woke to the sound of someone moving in their house. When she looked over, Russ was fast asleep next to her. It could have been her two boys, but something told Barbara it was an intruder. In her sleep-muddled mind, she thought it best that she check out the noise before alerting the whole family in case it was nothing. Barbara reached for the gun under Russ's pillow and that's when everything went wrong. When she tried to move it, the gun accidentally went off, shooting Russ in the back of the head. Three for three. Three for three. I just had a whole thing about why would you leave it there? Or hopefully that's what happened because that could have been a story she told the police. You know what I'm saying? That, could, that, that So we, I can't jump to say that's what it was because she could have been lying. Horrified, Barbara called 911 at 6.08 a.m. and EMTs rushed to the house. At first... Because she could have been trying to bail out of debt by what? Insurance money. It's another avenue she could... 
So I don't know which way this is gonna go. There seemed to be some hope, as Russ was still alive when they arrived. But he died a few hours later. The police investigated this strange and shocking death and concluded that Barbara wasn't lying. And the gun had truly gone off accidentally. But it was Russ's first wife, Jo Lynn, who couldn't accept that Russ's death was an accident. She began campaigning to have the case reopened and told police that Russ had confided to her that Barbara mistreated him and he was afraid of her. He also told her that if anything happened to him, Barbara did it. The pro told y'all that could be. That could be. And you people be knowing it, bro. And they start to confide in people. In his case, he confided in his ex. People be knowing, fam. They know. I knew that seemed kind of fishy, bro. Back to being three for three. Problem was, even though the police may have been interested in pursuing Russ's death as more than an accident, there was no proof. This is until a student was snooping around a locker at the high school where Russ had worked. Within the locker was a tape made by Russ. The student brought the tape to the authorities, who were shocked to hear what Russ had recorded. Russ had begun to feel unsafe around his wife and suspicious about some of her actions. He decided that the best thing he could do was create an audio diary detailing some of the things that she had done. Mm. In the recording, he talked about their debts and Barbara's unwillingness to stop spending money, as well as her expectation that he provide the life for her that she wanted. But more interestingly, Russ also recorded that he had recently caught Barbara having an affair, one he had witnessed himself by walking into the room and catching her kissing another man. The last entry that Russ had made was three days before his death, and it was the most telling. Russ told the recorder that she continued waking him up in the night, trying to give him pills. He said, quote, Last night, she woke me up and gave me what she said was two aspirins. She stood there to see if I took it. I did not take it. When he looked closer in the morning, he found out that the pills were not aspirin, but actually sleeping pills. Forensics were soon deployed and discovered that Barbara's story about the gun accidentally going off didn't actually make sense. It revealed that the gun was never kept under the pillow as Barbara claimed but actually in a side drawer. And Russ also didn't ever keep the gun loaded. It didn't make sense. That's what I'm saying. Why would you put the, the gun? He kept it in the drawer. She said he kept three for three, bro. Three for three. As well, because of the model of the gun, it required four pounds of pressure on the trigger, which couldn't have been done accidentally. Barbara was soon arrested under suspicion of murder. While in court, it was revealed that Barbara's first husband had died in a similar manner, earning her the nickname a Black Widow Killer. Larry Ford, Barbara's first husband, had died after an allegedly accidental shooting in High Point, North Carolina. In this case, Barbara claims that Larry's gun went off while he was cleaning it. This shooting, too, was seen as a tragic mishap. In Russ's tape, he expressed his own suspicion that Barbara's first husband's death hadn't been an accident. Allegedly, Barbara's motive in Russ's death was a $170,000 life insurance policy as she couldn't stand the lower budget lifestyle they had recently adopted. Drops Mike. Because of the tapes, not only did police have enough suspicion to look deeper into Barbara, but because of his recordings, the jury heard Russ's own voice telling them just how fearful he was of his wife. Barbara Stagger was convicted in 1989 for murdering Russ and given the death penalty. However, this was commuted. She is currently serving life in prison. Though these surprising cases of people solving their own deaths and naming their killers after they have passed may seem like a phenomenon, it happens more often than you may think. Yo, 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 yo. 
And the crazy part was, you wanna know what the crazy part was? That last bit of information they gave us at the end. She had done this previously to another, to her ex-husband. And gotten away with it. Man, listen, bro. Don't let nobody wake y'all up and tell y'all to take something. Y'all don't know what it is. And instead of recording it, go to the police. That's the only issue. Like, bro, why didn't you go to the police instead of just recording it? You had reasonable suspicion. Reasonable. Take the recordings you got and go to the police. You should have been recording her too. Man, I ain't had to go out like that. But I knew something didn't seem right. It didn't. It didn't. Man, this one, another crazy one, bro. I'm telling you, fam, these are the dopest things on, on YouTube. I can't, I can't tear my, you know how some of y'all get addicted to like CSI and all that type of stuff? I'm addicted. I'm addicted to this stuff. But this is the best content out there, man. Wouldn't you agree? Y'all get at me in the comment section. Let me know what you think. And stick around and stay tuned. Till the next reaction of my piece. Y'all stay solid. I'm gone.